It's a pleasure to welcome you to the annual Patsy Belt Conradi's Summer Science Research Symposium. This symposium is funded by a gift from Nancy Schneider in honor of her classmate, Patsy Belt Conradi's. Each year, we are pleased to present the work of students who have participated in the Summer Science Research uh, Program. Uh, that research often happens in laboratories on this campus, but it also happens in laboratories in other parts of the country and even sometimes in other parts of the world. This year, much of that research happened virtually, and our presentation this year comes virtually as well. I hope you will enjoy uh, the opportunity to see the amazing research undertaken by our students uh, through this work. One of the hallmarks of Ohio Wesleyan is its commitment to undergraduate research, particularly in the sciences. And that hallmark has re been recognized, including in the recent National Science Foundation doctoral completion study, which found that Ohio Wesleyan students, graduates are in the top 1% uh, in the country of students who complete degrees in the biological sciences and go on to earn doctoral degrees. We're pleased to welcome you today and to see the work of our students at the annual Summer Science Research Symposium. Excellent. And so without further ado, what I'd like to do is have each of the four students presenting in this session just go uh, and briefly identify yourselves and your name. And you can do that in the order that you appear on the website. And then we will go through and have each student give a three minute um, summary of their research for the summer. So Sierra, you're on first. Would you like to get us started? Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, hi, I'm Sierra Spears, and uh, my, my project was plasticity and thermoregulatory behavior and performance in response to hy hypoxia and Iverlacerta banali. Thanks, Sierra. And we have Princeton is listed next. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Princeton Vaughn. Um, and my project was body structure performance trade-offs in a lizard. Thanks, Princeton. And Ross, you're up next. Hi, everyone. Um, I was studying nest defense behavior of um, house wrens, and I am a junior. Excellent. Thanks, Ross. And Holly. Um, hi, I'm Holly Keating, and uh, my project was studying song variation in Carolina wrens. Thanks, Holly. So what we'll do is each student will uh, give a brief summary of their project that will last no more than three minutes, and we'll go in the same order. And then after all four students have presented, we'll open things up for questions and discussion. So Sierra, you can go ahead and get us started. Okay, so my project uh, revolved around these high elevation lizards called, sorry, Ibro Lacerda banali. And what this project did was it looked at um, how the different elevations that they're found at, or no, sorry, the, the oxygen availability in their environment. It, my project looked at how the different oxygen availability impacted their thermal preference and thermal performances at different elevations. So we collected them all from one high elevation and then we split them into two groups. One continued at high elevation and one up was moved to a lower elevation. And then at both groups we ran uh, thermal preference tests using a thermal arena with a thermal gradient in it and then uh, a thermal performance test, which was a racetrack that we raced them down. And um, my job specifically within this project uh, was to take, was to analyze the thermal images of the lizards in the thermal arena. And I analyzed them looking at head and body temperatures and the differences between the head and body temperatures looking for evidence of one of the thermal regulatory strategies often employed by asserted lizards called regional heterothermy, which is when the head and the body are actually different temperatures within like the same lizard, which is pretty cool. Um, and that's used 
to keep the brain from overheating, especially in like high temperature, sorry, high temperature environments, which is being more and more found with climate change. So, um, but just to, sorry, this project um, isn't actually done yet. We're hoping to be done by 2021. And um, I couldn't, of course, even hope to do this without collaboration from my collaborators, um, Dr. Eric Engla from OWU, Laura Kumujan, I'm so sorry, Laura Kumujan, and uh, Fabian Aubred, um, all of which were amazing. And this was their project idea. And I was just pleased as hell, or, sorry. I was very excited to help them along with this project. Um, so once this project is finally done, um, we'll have a bunch of data and we predict that this data is gonna look like, um, we predict that the lizards transplanted to lower elevations would have higher thermal preferences in the thermal arena uh, due to the increased oxygen availability and that which would help them maintain a higher metabolism. Sierra, thanks. I'm going to uh, just pause you right there and just make sure we have time to get to everyone. So I will direct everyone to Sierra's link on the website for more on her predictions and upcoming results. Um, but we do need to move on. Thanks, Sierra. Um, I'm going to uh, send it to Princeton then. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Princeton Vaughn, as I said. Um, and I studied body structure performance trade-offs in a lizard. And so, um, for lizards especially, we know that running performance is especially important because it helps them escape predators, catch food, defend territory, and track down mates. Um, and lots of things affect running performance, such as body size, leg size, and substrate type. And so this summer, we, we actually performed an experiment to, to examine the factors that influence uh, running performance. Um, and so I studied the common wall lizard, which are actually native to Europe, but, but, but they're actually invasive in Cincinnati. Um, and since Cincinnati is a novel environment, it is especially interesting to see what, to, to see what, what kind of results we have. Um, and so I measured uh, sprint speed under, under simulated uh, wood, grass, and concrete. And we also had, uh, we, so, okay, sorry. Um, um, I measured sprint speed under simulated grass, wood, and concrete with and without obstacles and on a flat or a 30 degree incline uh, racetrack. And so some of the cool findings are that we see that, that lizards actually run faster up the 30 degree incline as opposed to on a flat track. And future work is uh, sort of going to be directed to figure out why that is. But I hypothesize that this is because their their like uh, running posture actually is is um, is actually more more conducive to running up a slant than running on flat surfaces. Uh, we also see that bigger lizards run faster when there are no obstacles present, but, but this, this advantage is actually lost when there are obstacles. And we see that lizards who, who run faster on one substrate run slower on the other two. And this work is actually pretty important because it allows us to study how animals respond to new environments. Great, thank you, Princeton. And now we'll send it over to Ross for a summary of his project. Hi, um, so my project was on um, nest defense behaviors of house wrens. House wrens are small um, passerines, so they're songbirds. They're um, native to North America and they, um, they like have to deal with nest predators that invade their nests and um, will eat their eat and kill their offspring. So basically in this experiment, I wanted to see whether 
they would respond differently to two types of predators. So I used a rat snake model and a chipmunk model, which are both very common nest predators. Um, and we recorded the, uh, we basically set up trials and recorded the um, behaviors that the wrens would exhibit. Like um, they would fly over like very closely um, and they would even, some of them would even hit the decoys. Um, there were many varied uh, responses. Some were very aggressive, some like completely abandoned the nest. Um, basically, we found that there was not a difference between the two predators, which was very interesting because they're very different looking um, like organisms and an Eastern chipmunk looks nothing like a rat snake. And, um, so there was no significant difference in any of the metrics that we set up to test if there was a difference in, um, like response. Uh, we used paired T tests and linear mixed models to like uh, analyze the data we collected. Um, we did, we had a total sample size of 97 trials. Um, we were not able to determine if any of the trials were repeats um, because these, these birds will re-nest twice in a season um, and they'll switch mates. So some of these may have been repeat um, parents. We also collected the data on the female parent as they would be more likely to defend the nest as they have a higher energetic value having laid the eggs versus males who just needed to um, help with like food production and um, so for future directions we would like to I would like to continue this and look at if there are uh, hormones that regulate this behavior such as corticosterone or testosterone or even prolactin as like mother uh, that relates to mothers um, like caregiving behavior um, and it would also be interesting to add a large predatory bird model that poses not only a risk for the um, nestlings, but also for the actual adult house runs to see if risk weighing plays a role in anti-predator behavior. Uh, so thanks, um, Ross. I'm going to stop you there. Sorry, but I want to make sure we get through all the presentations in the little time we have, but I'll direct everyone to the web to check out more details of your future directions. And so our last presentation comes from Holly Keating. Thanks, Holly. Um, hi, I'm Holly. Um, my project over the summer was mentored by Dr. Reichert and Dr. Schultz. Um, I did mine remotely and I looked at the variations in song structure of Carolina wrens. Most temperate uh, songbirds only sing during the summer season when they're breeding and defending their territories but Carolina wrens are unique because they also sing during the summer months, which is the non-breeding season for them. Um, so despite that interesting trait about them, they're actually severely understudied. There's very little actual research out about them in general, and there's nothing out there about their songs. So my project looked at the breeding versus non-breeding songs, but we also looked at song structure over various decades and also in different regions of the United States because their, uh, their range is very, very broad over the Eastern United States and even into Canada and Mexico a little bit. Um, so we did this by collecting recordings from different online databases. I used the Florida Museum of Natural History, um, eBird, the Macaulay Library, and uh, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Um, so in total, I collected a lot more songs than I actually used because I did have to screen them for clarity and whether or not they were actually songs or calls. But I ended up having about 300 of breeding songs and 300 of non-breeding songs. The major results showed that uh, breeding songs are slightly longer and have more syllables, but they're actually slower than non-breeding songs, which is interesting. And they also have less notes per time. Um, also interestingly, there was a very, very minor correlation with song structure and latitude, but the songs did not change significantly since the 1950s, which we were expecting them to evolve more over time, but they seem to be fairly consistent. Um, so overall, I think going forward, 
what should really be looked into is the mechanisms behind that song because most male song is related to testosterone during the breeding season, but in the non-breeding season, they don't produce as much testosterone. So that could be an interesting factor. We also feel we need to look more into why they're singing during the non-breeding season, since they're obviously not mating during that time, but they may, they may be still bonding with their mates or defending territories. Um, we also thought it would be interesting to look more into the species as a whole because while we are assuming that the females don't sing, like most temperate songbirds, we don't really know that for sure because it's really hard to tell males and females apart. So I think it would be interesting to look into female song as more as well. All right, thank you, Holly. So we have just a short minute here for any questions for any of our student researchers. So I'll just open up the floor if anyone has a question. Okay, I'll ask a quick question then. So I'm curious to know from any of you, what was something that happened during your experiment that was kind of surprising and that you had to adjust your planning and your experiment around? And, and any of the four of you feel free to answer that. Um, so one of the challenges I came up against was uh, basically trying to disturb the birds as little as possible while setting up the trials. Um, and then when ending the trials as well, cause we had to remove the, we had to remove the model after a certain amount of time. Um, so basically one of the creative ways we came up like to solve that was we attached each of the models to a fishing pole and then we would reel in the models after the trial ended. We use fishing poles to catch lizards as well. So they, they, they came in handy this summer. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. There are other SSRP sessions starting right now at one o'clock. So out of respect for that, we will end here. But I want to encourage everyone to check out the link. It's posted in the chat to all of these students' great work over the summer. And contact information is posted there as well with questions or anything uh, like that. So let's go ahead and just give a quick round of applause for our student researchers. And we can all get over to the others.